All right, so welcome back to Ecology. On <clears throat> Tuesday, I've distributed that take-home exam, so if you haven't found it on uh, Blackboard, I'd go ahead and do that. Uh, this lecture is for Thursday, <coughs> uh, and we're starting into a new set of material, uh, <coughs> basically community ecology. So the first thing we should probably do is define community, <coughs> uh, and uh, I think we did that at the beginning of the semester, let's go ahead and do it again. So a community is a group of species that occur in the same time and place. Alright, so we could talk about the forest community uh, in Erie Bluff State Park, or we could talk about the community of fish in Presque Isle Bay, Bluff State Park, or the fish in Presque Isle Bay. All of these would be communities because we're talking about a group of species, in this case a group of plant species, in this case a group of fish species, <clears throat> but they're all in the same time and place. Uh, often when we talk about communities, uh, we are limiting it to specific taxa, and that's because the ecologists working in those systems often are very versed in a particular group of taxa, but not others. Right, an ichthyologist working in Presque Isle Bay may not be as concerned with the zooplankton or phytoplankton communities. On the other hand, uh, <clears throat> sometimes you do run into ecologists that are very interested in the entire uh, community of all taxa, in which case we could talk about the species overall in the Erie Bluff State Park or the species overall in Presque Isle Bay. Okay, now, the way ecologists tend to think about communities is uh, very much affected by the type of community that they work in. So, uh, <clears throat> if I worked in Presque Isle Bay or the Erie Bluff State Park, I would define the community uh, based on its <clears throat> location. Okay, right, because Presque Isle Bay is a very defined geographic area. Erie Bluff State Park is a very defined geographic area. <clears throat> On the other hand, uh, there are <clears throat> communities defined by uh, particular species that are dominant, right? So I could talk about the... Uh, I'm trying to think off the top of my head out at the Erie Bluff State Park. Uh, <clears throat> right. <clears throat> the Black Oak Savannah. Uh, this would be a particular community type, <clears throat> but it's defined by the species that is dominant in that particular community type, so therefore it's a Black Oak Savannah. Or I could have a mixed hardwood community, right, that would be dominated around here by oaks and uh, maple trees, right? So uh, we could define a community based on its location. We could also define it based on a particular dominant species or a group of dominant species, okay? All right, now... <clears throat> We can define communities into two broad categories. There are open communities and there are closed communities. And this is de defined based on uh, the arrangement of species over particular geographic areas. So let's take a gradient here. Uh, let's make it a <clears throat> maybe a latitudinal gradient. So that means we're looking <clears throat> right north-south along a latitudinal gradient. And then we're going to put the frequency of individuals on the y-axis. 
So I have particular species that I'm interested in in this community, and these species are arranged along this latitudinal gradient. Some species, like this one, occur in a more northern part of my gradient, whereas there are other species, like this one, that occur more south in the gradient. So if I filled in all of my species, uh, I don't know, let's make it a, a group of tree species. So we're talking about a forest that corresponds to a, a particular latitudinal gradient. And let's fill in these species. All right, so some species have a very restricted distribution. They only occupy a very narrow range along my uh, latitudinal gradient. Other species have a very broad distribution, right? They're, they're occurring over a much uh, larger latitudinal range than other species. <clears throat> but if you notice, there, there aren't any particular gaps in here. It looks like particular species occur in particular parts of the gradient, and they intergrade very nicely with uh, other species that occur along this latitudinal gradient, right? <clears throat> Each species uh, shows up at a particular latitude and then disappears at a particular latitude. This could be because of particular species requirements, right? Temperature requirements, light requirements, uh, the range in temperatures throughout the year, at particular latitudes, other species like herbivores or pathogens show up or don't show up. But this particular community type is referred to as an open community. There are no <clears throat> very specific boundaries for the community. Or another way to think about it is the distribution of species are independent of each other. And remember, distribution here, even though we're looking at a plot, <coughs> is uh, spatial distribution, right? Because we're talking about a gradient. So the distribution, where the species and where it isn't, of a species is independent of other species. <coughs> that is, you can't use... The distribution of species, one, to predict the distribution of any of the other species within the community, because they all have distributions that, in a sense, <clears throat> look very random with respect to each other. Okay? All right, that's a, <clears throat> an open community. On the other hand, some communities are closed. Uh, let's do this again. Could be a latitudinal gradient but I'm going to change this to environmental gradient. Again, frequency on the x-axis, or on the y-axis, showing us numbers of individuals in some fashion. <clears throat> There's the distribution of one species, distribution of another species. <clears throat> now I have a group of species, but there seems to be a point here where pretty much all of my species are kind of stopping, right? Along this gradient, none of these species seem to occur further along in this gradient. On the other hand, over here, <clears throat> I have a group of species, and they seem to occur at a different place along the environmental gradient. And again, the distribution of this group of species seems to stop about the same place that the other species distribution stop. These two would be referred to as closed communities. Right, they're closed communities because <clears throat> there's a very sharp point here where the community ends and the community begins. Community 1 here ends here. Community 2 begins here along this same environmental gradient. 
Okay. All right. <clears throat> or the other way to think about it, the distribution of a species is predictive of the distribution of other species. Right? I can pick any one of these species and predict where the distribution of the other species will end because it tends to coincide at this same location. Right? This location where <clears throat> species are disappearing and other species are appearing along this gradient is called an ecotone. Okay? And that ecotone, just checking my notes here to make sure I've got it, is a region of rapid replacement of species. Region of rapid replacement of species. All right, I have a group of species that are being replaced very rapidly here as I move along the environmental gradient. Okay? There, there's probably something here along this environmental gradient that's helping to explain this ecotone, this transition between one community type and another. Now, ecotones are kind of interesting. Uh, sometimes these ecotones are very sharp. These are all my species distributions here. There are my species distributions there. I would refer to this as a sharp ecotone. On the other hand, some ecotones might look more like this. I would still refer to these as closed communities because the distribution is ending in about the same place. We may be talking about a few yards or a few meters. This is still an ecotone. It's still a region of rapid replacement of species, but instead of being a sharp ecotone, it's more fuzzy, it's more broad. Some species seem to be able to exist in that other community type, and some of these species exist within the other community type, but it's still a region of rapid replacement of species. So I have an example here of, sorry, yeah, a couple of these ecotones. <clears throat> this would be a sharp ecotone, and I can see these sharp ecotones here. I'm in the Bay of Fundy, New Brunswick, uh, very, very broad tides. There's a really low, low, and a really high, high. Very remarkable transition during the day between these tides. And you can see these lines here. So this uh, region in here is intertidal. That's the littoral zone. We mentioned that uh, last week. And uh, this, if this is the lowest tide right here, this is the sublittoral right below the intertidal zone, the sublittoral. So the sublittoral here, that's a community type. Then there's the part where uh, you're exposed to air sometimes but not others. That's this region here. That's the littoral. And up here, that could be called terrestrial, or some people call it a supralittoral, right above the littoral zone. But notice these very sharp lines you're seeing here. These sharp lines are defined by the presence and absence of particular species. This looks like, to me, fucus. That's a brown alga, fucus vesiculosus. No, fucus vesiculosum, sorry. <clears throat> and uh, where it exists is where you get covered at some point during the day. Up here, no coverage, no fucus. Okay? So that would be a very sharp ecotone. You know exactly where one community type starts and another community type ends. On the other hand, these ecotones can be much broader or fuzzier. <clears throat> and this is a group of plant species. All right, so what we've done is, is, is run a transect along here. Right? We have 
a transect running, and that transect will have particular locations where we sample. We have some species like black oak that are moving out to here, so along our transect. There's black oak, there's poison oak, there's iris, here's Douglas fir, here's hawkweed, there's fescue, and then we've got snake root, <coughs> canyon oak, columbia, ragwort, yarrow, buckbrush, fescue, fireweed, and knotweed. So again, here, <coughs> that's my ecotone, but it's much fuzzier. I have a particular community type here composed of these species, another community type over here composed of these species, and then I have this area in between where species from one community type integrate or mix together with species of the other community type. Okay? All right, the one on the left, that community type is formed because the soil is very different from the soil type associated with the other community. This other community is associated with serpentine soils. <clears throat> and over here, uh, we have non-serpentine soils. So this here, serpentine, non-serpentine, with the ecotone between them. And serpentine soils are defined based on the presence or absence of particular mineral nutrients. So you can see that in the serpentine soils, the concentration of chromium is high, nickel is high, magnesium is high. And then over here in the uh, non-serpentine soil, serpentine soils, we have low iron and low copper. Calcium seems to be pretty much the same across the two soil types. So you have this high calcium, high copper over here, high chromium, nickel, and manganese, or sorry, chromium, nickel, and magnesium on this 